Every great story needs an anti-hero, a truly flawed character that endures the same kind of pain we all do, someone we can relate to that goes through a ride of true ups and downs, who can dazzle us one minute and show us how imperfect it truly is in the next one. When it comes to football, that character was Paul Gascoigne, the British superstar with a liking for controversy. His parents named him Paul John Gascoigne after Paul McCartney and John Lennon of the Beatles. A fitting backstory for the drama-fueled life we much more often associate with the art world. Being born in a football-loving country like England, it was impossible for him not to be brought up amongst its culture. Soon, his talents would be noticed as he played for his school's football team, but as the trials kept coming, he kept being sent back. First came Ipswich Town, then Middlesbrough and Southampton, as it seemed that the kid would eventually be referred to as England's very own Diego Maradona, would not manage to find a club to play for. A new opportunity came his way, and from nowhere else than the club he loved and supported, Newcastle United. Before all of this, Gaza was what they called a problem child. He ran around the streets looking for trouble and causing it as well. Of course, that his upbringing in a low-income family, living in council homes and constantly moving from one city to the other did not help balance his life and make him a more stable person. He was a product of his environment. If he was troubled before, one day he would make it all much worse. Gaza would take his friend's younger brother out to a local shop, and once he got distracted going about his business, the young boy would run out of the shop and get ran over by an ice cream truck. Gaza would run out to find a lifeless body laying on the road. In his own words, it was the first time I ever saw that body. I felt Stephen's death was my fault. Things wouldn't get easier over time, soon another of his friends would die in an accident inside the construction zone. Later on, his father would start suffering from seizures and all of this would impact his mental state. He started becoming obsessive and soon began having twitches. He started therapy but would abandon treatment as his parents believed it wasn't working. Eventually, he would admit to having dealt with suicidal thoughts from as early as the age of seven. And then came the first few signs of his addictive personality. He would find out about slot machines and get so obsessed with them that he would frequently spend all his money on them and soon after, as he needed more money to keep playing, he began shoplifting. During his time playing at Newcastle's youth team, he was coached by Jack Charlton, the older brother of Bobby Charlton, who would note that Gaza was far too fat to be a footballer, telling him that he had two weeks to lose the weight or he'd be dropped from the team. So Gaza started going for runs dressed in a trash bag, hoping the heat would make him lose weight faster. I mean, <laughs> it actually adds up, but it's still hilarious. Of course, Gaza would make it, and soon it captained the youth squad to a FA Cup win, scoring twice in the final. His reward for these performances would come, as he would be called up for the first team for the first time. This would culminate in Paul signing his first contract with Newcastle at the age of 18. At the time, Paul, known for being overly generous with his money, would have Newcastle arrange for half of his salary to be paid once he was older, in order to stop him from splurging on gifts for friends and family. He would then play two years as a regular starter, slowly developing into what Newcastle's all-time top scorer Jackie Milburn would refer to as the best player in the world. The next year he would score 11 goals, but the most memorable moment would come as Vinnie Jones, known for being one of the toughest defenders ever, would grab Gascoigne's um, genitals, leading him to scream in pain, which would make for some pretty iconic photos. By the end of the year, Gascoigne would win the PFA Young Player of the Year award and would be part of the league's team of the year. Unfortunately, Newcastle were going through a tough time financially and would be forced to let go of their talented youngster. Alex Ferguson had been in awe of this young man for a while, so he would jump on the opportunity to sign him, and eventually Gaza would promise him that he would join Manchester United. Still, Ferguson would leave on vacation, and then he would hear on the news that Gaza had signed for Tottenham for £2.2 .2 million, a record between two British teams. Later on, he would tell the press that they swayed Gaza to their club by promising him they would give his parents a house. At Tottenham, Gaza's first season would go smoothly, though relatively unremarkable, with the coach who allowed him the space and freedom on the pitch to develop. The 22-year-old, though impressive, would not be enough to make the difference and Tottenham would only finish sixth on the table. 
The following year would be far more important as he would partner with someone who would change his career forever. Gary Lineker. Unlike Gaza, Lineker was a clean-cut, straightforward, no-nonsense poacher who famously never once got booked in his career. Even saying they were polar opposites feels like a complete understatement. This wouldn't be the first time they had met though. They had shared the pitch on three occasions for England, but Gaza, being the young upcoming talent he was, only managed to play more than a few minutes in one of these occasions. Still, if it served to show how good they were together, the one time it happened, both of them got on the score sheet. Throughout their first season together, they would turn Spurs into a scary side to face. Lineker would score 24 goals in the league and top the charts. But still, as the awards were handed out, it would be Gascoigne who would win Tottenham Player of the Year, a reward for his never-ending supply of chances that he would just gracefully hand to Lineker. If this season had made sure that everyone in England realized the power of this duo, over the summer they would combine at the World Cup to make sure that truly everyone knew about the power within them. From the beginning, England looked shaky. Only two goals in the group stage would seem to only win one match, though our fabled duo would be involved in both. As the knockout rounds came, England met Belgium and the game would go all the way into extra time. It would be in the 119th minute that Gascoigne would assist the winning goal. Then came Cameroon, another dramatic extra time match where Gascoigne sort of assisted Lineker in an unusual way. Gascoigne would provide the tight through pass that would force the Cameroon players to foul Lineker inside the box, leading him to score the opener through a penalty. Then came the semi-final and one of the most iconic moments in the career of Paul Gascoigne. As Lineker tied the match with 10 minutes to go, the stadium erupted in cheers. Little did they know that before the end of the match, they would watch Gaza in tears in the middle of the pitch. One mistimed tackle and even if England managed to make the final, Gaza, now with two yellow cards, would have to miss it. Even if Robson took Lineker's famous advice to have a word with him, perhaps this moment robbed him of the audacity and euphoria needed to turn the game around. We will never know. What happened in fact was that in penalties, Germany earned the one ticket left to the final. A moment like this could have enraged the fans, turned them against him, anything really. But here comes the main trait of the anti-hero, his ability to relate to others. People saw the flaws in Gaza affect one of the greatest moments in his career. We all have gone through that. Seeing one of our flaws we've battled for so long ruin things we desired so deeply. It's the sort of heartfelt moment that made him a hero for the people. The following season would show everyone that Gaza could take it all a step further. He would score 19 goals in 37 matches, by far his highest ever goal-scoring tally. And though Tottenham were looking flimsy in the league, they would go all the way in the FA Cup. With Gaza scoring 6 goals in the 5 matches up to the final, including a stunning free kick versus rivals Arsenal in the semi-finals just 5 minutes into the match. Before the final, Tottenham would be forced to admit to the awful financial state they were in, and the solution was simple, though painful, to sell Gaza to the highest bidder. And so, before the final was played, a deal was reached but not closed with Lazio, that would see him leave for £8.5 million, half a million more than Roberto Baggio, the transfer record at the time. The final would go all sorts of wrong for Gascoigne, except for what really mattered. 14 minutes in, he would perform a dangerous knee-high tackle on Gary Charles and would instantly be seen in pain on the ground. After getting some medical help, he would step up to see Nottingham Forest go in front through the free kick. To further ruin his day, shortly after, he would collapse in pain and be carried out of the stadium and taken to the nearest hospital. Lineker would also be having an off day, but happily, thanks to an own goal, Tottenham would eventually win the trophy. Bet you hadn't heard that one in a long time, huh? Unfortunately, one thing has been left unsaid. The injury would leave Gaza on the sidelines for over a year. Though to be fair, an incident in a nightclub would be one of the reasons the injury ended up lasting for so long. Over this time, Gaza's story was so popular that the updates would often overshadow news about the ongoing financial crisis in English newspapers. Eventually, as he managed to come back, the deal with Lazio would be adjusted, now worth just 5.5 million pounds, making him the new English transfer record, but now being less than half of the new worldwide transfer record set by Gianluigi Lentini. 
in his first season at Lazio, he struggled with many things. Outside of the pitch, he hit reporters, he burnt down microphones and he even managed to get on the wrong side of the club owner by telling him how much he enjoyed his daughter's breasts. Yep, you heard that one right. On the pitch though, he struggled with fitness. Having been one season without playing and soon enough, he would be aware that his performances were starting to cost him the love of the fans. Before a match against Roma, he would say, for me, this match, this Sunday, is of life or death and I hope I'm still alive on Monday. And indeed, he would manage to perform well and earn the fans' trust once again, scoring a last-minute equalizer. This game would also be notable for the reaction of the Roma fans to the English superstar, unfolding a banner which mocked his weight and throwing chocolate bars at him whenever he approached the stands. Of course, Gaza wasn't just gonna have it, so he picked one up and ate it. The following match he would score once again after an incredible Maradona-style run, getting past several defenders before slotting it in. Before the end of the season he would score another two goals that would earn his team two draws against Milan and Atalanta, which would help Lazio in their journey to an eventual fifth place finish and their first qualification for the European competitions in over 16 years. Still, this season had been troubled, as the Italian media would fail to see the charm in his eccentric behavior that the British had always seemed to enjoy. Over time he became more and more of a target and an outcast, especially as his coach Dino Zoff began to get on the media's side. Zoff cited his reasoning for not calling up the player as due to his poor physical condition. When Gaza was asked about it, he responded by burping onto the microphone. They didn't like that either. It seemed Gaza was one knock away from the railing at all times and then it came as his ex-personal assistant published a book telling everyone his deepest secrets, including the fact that he'd been suffering from bulimia for a while then. Gaza felt he couldn't trust anyone and became even more paranoid with the media. Before the next season, Zoff had enough of his poor shape and he managed he lost all his excess weight before the start of the next season and so he did. But then he got injured and Zoff said he should go on holiday to recover. Gaza said no, but the staff insisted and eventually accepted. Once he returned, he had gained all the weight back. Zoff complained and Gaza replied, I told you not to send me on holiday. Well, this second season would be one riddled with injuries and emotional distress. Gaza would eventually miss a training session and tell the media, if I take days off, it's not because I hate Lazio. Sometimes I just need to relax. The others don't experience the pressure I have. Some days I'm in tears. I think to myself, I'm a young lad. I shouldn't have to take all this. I can cope with it. I hide behind the fact that I try to be funny, but when I need to be, I can be a serious person. At this point, everything seemed set to go wrong, and so it did. Gascoigne would be in training when he entered the duel with a youth team defender and ended up breaking his own leg. Once it happened, both started crying, Gaza of pain and the young defender of shock. The young boy's name, you ask? Alessandro Nesta. After this, Gaza was forced into a very tight fitness routine in order to recover faster and he did not like it at all, especially as he would still only manage to play two games over that third season. So he decided to talk to the club and finally part ways. Among all this mess, he still managed to convince Rangers to pay a club record fee of 4.3 million pounds to sign him and if anyone thought this was a bad move for the club, let me tell you that Gascoigne was immense for them, scoring 19 goals in his first season, matching the best tally of his career and even scoring against their rival Celtic, which would lead to their only defeat of the season, especially essential as Rangers would only beat them in the league by 5 points. Over summer, he would take part in the Euro 1996, after long years where for one reason or another he would end up missing or having only brief stints at any of the international competitions that were available. Regardless, in this one he would shine. In the second match he would score perhaps one of the greatest goals of his career as he faced Scotland. The ball would come in his direction and he would flick it over the defender before volleying it straight into the net to make it even more iconic, he would celebrate by laying on the ground as his teammates sprayed water into his mouth. A reference to their recent drama with the press, who had caught them getting cocktails fed to them in a nightclub while they sat on a dentist's chair for some reason. 
Eventually, they would meet Germany in the semi-finals and though it would be Gareth Southgate who would miss the deciding penalty, the memorable moment would come as Gaza would fail to connect his shots as he found himself with an open net on the 99th minute, one of the biggest what-ifs in the history of English football. The following season would be pretty straightforward, with Gaza playing even better and leading Rangers towards a second domestic double, averaging over a goal every two games for the second time in his career. On his third season, things finally started looking bad for him. Even though he kept performing, Rangers started dropping points and his controversies returned as he celebrated a goal by playing the flutes, a gesture associated with Orange Order, an unionist organization based on Northern Ireland. As you might imagine, the IRA did not find it funny and as they often do, they decided to send him death threats. Soon, he would decide to leave, joining Middlesbrough for £3.5 million, finishing out the season with them and helping them achieve promotion. At this point, Gascoigne's drinking habits had been a problem for years, but they got far worse once he started blaming himself for the death of one of his friends while on a night out. His mental state deteriorated so fast that he began experiencing blackouts and eventually went into rehab. Regardless, it somehow didn't stop him from performing, in fact he did so well that by Christmas, Middlesbrough would be in a miraculous 4th place, just 6 points off the top despite having just recently gotten promoted. Eventually, they would finish the season in 9th, still impressive enough to ensure Gascoigne that he would get called up for the 1998 World Cup, but then, it all came down crashing. He was pictured eating kebab and mocked for his weight and unsportsmanlike behavior. This led the English coach at the time to change his mind about calling him up. Gaza took it so poorly that he ended up wrecking his office in a fit of rage. As he started the next season by breaking his arm, he went into a serious decline, eventually being released by the club and joining Everton instead. Where between a series of annoying injuries and his back and forth with rehabilitation, Gaza never managed to cause an impact. To finish off his career, he played at Burnley, leaving as they failed to get promoted, then in China, where he terminated his own contract as he believed he had to return home due to psychological problems, and finally Boston United, a three-month spell he ended without much explanation. Today, 17 years after his retirement, Gaza claims he's been more sober than ever, but still, his controversies haven't stopped from racially abusing bodyguards to allegedly sexually assaulting a woman in a train, there's much from where to pick from. Gaza was quite simply the most talented British player of all time. He was an outright genius with a ball at his feet, a pleasure to watch, a trouble flawed, but to a certain degree lovable character, the anti-hero football needed. Now getting into the ratings. First of all, I wasn't even sure he should be rated, given the many external factors that impacted his career. So I decided to do it, but also to include an option in the poll in the description for his rating to be excluded from the rankings. Regardless, trying to be as unbiased as possible, let's rate him. Finishing is a 7 out of 10, he could score some great goals but saying he was prolific would be too much. Playmaking was a 9 out of 10, he was amazing but not a perfect playmaker. Dribbling was exceptional, mesmerizing to watch at times, a 10 out of 10. At his prime, speed and physicality was a good mix but considering he had some serious weight gain issues at times, I can only give him a 6 out of 10. Mentality was something he clearly struggled with and though most of his issues came from his troubled childhood, I can only give him a 6 out of 10. Longevity and adaptability is a 7 out of 10 considering he played in 3 different countries with relative success in all of them. Flair is the easiest one, a 10 out of 10. Trophy cabinet is a huge disappointment, only a 5 out of 10. Finally, the icon factor would be an 8, mainly to, to how much she is loved in England. Of course, as you might imagine, this totals out to a mere 68 out of 90, tied with Tevez for the lowest in the series. Truly not representative of how good it could be. That's what led me to question whether I should have included this part or not, and to decide to let you make the decision, so don't forget to vote in the link in the description for whether you think he was just a good player, maybe the greatest of all time, or if you think he shouldn't even be rated at all. I also have to mention that to my shock, Ribéry managed an incredible high X factor that pumped him up really high on the table, but hey, if that's what you guys think he deserves, then that's what it will be. So this was Paul Gascoigne's career in a video I hope you enjoyed, if you didn't forget to like and subscribe.
thanks guys and see you next time bye